Dr. Sarah Saldivar. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah, Zaldivar. Zaldivar. Okay, perfect. So where, yeah. what's your heritage? So I am Lebanese. I lived all my life in Lebanon, halfway across the globe. And then when I was 25, I literally had just graduated with my master's in nutrition and dietetics. And in less than a month, I hopped on a plane on a one-way ticket to Miami to do my PhD in exercise physiology with a minor in nutrition. Technically, nutrition was like the supporting field. It was a whole year that you're supposed to take, but they took that out because obviously I had my bachelor's and my master's in nutrition dietetics. I was also a licensed dietitian. So yeah, I did that. And uh, after, and you know, I taught at the University of Miami and I worked on research um, while being a doctoral student. And, uh, and I also started teaching at Miami Dade College, which I continue to do up until today. That's great. So what made you want to get in the nutrition and, and physical background? Um, losing weight. <laughs> were you, I just wanted to lose weight. Were, did you deal with being overweight, like growing up? Oh, yeah. Ever since I hit puberty, I had started uh, putting on extra body fat. And I was very aware of it because one time, like a classmate of mine, I think we were like 11. And he said, oh, yeah, like very nonchalantly, like he would just say, oh, yeah, you're fat. I was like, what? I would be yeah. horrified. <laughs> And so it's ever since then, I that turned into a preoccupation with diets and weight loss and body image issues and low self-esteem and all that kind of stuff. And I tried crash diets and fad diets where I would starve myself and then binge. So that starvation binge cycle began um, and lasted for a while. And uh, depression, anxiety, we, there were more things going on at the time. It wasn't just the weight gain, you know, it was also just um, like... I grew up in an emotionally constipated family. <laughs> so mm. you didn't talk about your emotions. Um, you, I didn't have a good relationship with my parents. So it was a bunch of things, um, which obviously made my eating disorders worse. You know, the binge eating, um, depression, suicidal attempts. Um, so it was really, really bad. <laughs> but once I graduated high school, I didn't even go to like these, you know, when you do like uh, at the end of high school, you'll, you'll do like a, a party or a ceremony yeah. where it's just, just for fun, not like the official graduation ceremony. I didn't even go to that because I was just so horrified because I had gained weight and, you know, it was just really miserable. But once that was over and summer uh, was upon us, um, I was also working um, as a waitress. I started waitressing, um, waiting on tables when I was 17. So that last year of high school, I would work in the nights, like four nights a week and go to school. And so I continued to do that. So that summer I was working um, at that, that restaurant and preparing to start university and I was already starting to feel better a little bit where you have a little bit more independence as you get older. And uh, I was like, what am, what should I do? And I still had the fitness and the health thing because I always felt like I didn't have control over that. Um, and so that's why I ended up doing. But of course, <laughs> it turned out not to be probably the smartest thing that I could have done because they brainwashed me with all the worst possible nutritional advice, which, by the way, they still do to this day. You know, stay away from the fats and eat all the fiber and eat all of the carbohydrates. And that just, uh, in a way, it helped just understanding the notion of calories and if it fits your macros helped me gain a little bit more understanding that even if I ate something bad, it doesn't mean everything, you know, was over. I could still, you know, fit it in. So that helped a little bit, but definitely did not make, did not help me achieve my health and fitness goals any, any time, you know, any, any quicker. Yeah. So, yeah. I was going to ask you, I'm, you know, how did you see, or any, I mean, we're seeing it today, but the things that you were taught in school, I imagine is completely different from what you actually believe today. You know, yeah. like, you, know you need the carbs. I mean, I mean, the whole food pyramid that we're taught as kids <laughs> is almost completely like, I, I believe that it's almost, you know, garbage. I tend not to believe any of that. You're 100% right. It's worse than garbage. 100% right. And it's driven by really the fact that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is in bed with the food companies and they work hand in hand with them and they promote their products. And even before they worked so closely with them, 
it started by a group of people that had religious beliefs who thought that um, masturbation is a sin and that we should eat more vegetarian and vegan diets because that basically wipes out your libido. In other words, you become unhealthy. <laughs> it's like, great, let's push that. And so since then, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has still to this day been plagued by this uh, belief that um, plants are good and meat is bad. Um, and they just do the studies to confirm their biases and they cherry pick the studies to confirm their biases. And not once do they entertain the thought that they are so completely dead wrong. Right. So you more often than not today, like your personal diet is more of, is, is it carnivore. animal? Yeah. It's all carnivore or is it more animal carnivore. based? Okay. How did you get to uh, this? Yeah. Yeah. And let, let's not say carnivore because, you know, I had a quest bar today, so, <laughs> you know, but that's not like just today because I was, I really had like not even one moment to eat between my workouts and I had interviews and then another interview, but I try not to do more than one a day in terms of like calories, uh, not more than, you know, 200 calories of anything that's not um, carnivore. So it, the, the only things that I can think of is like, it could be a crust bar or it could be a collagen shake that sometimes I make. Hmm. I use the whole milk. I don't use almond milk. And I'll do like one cup of berries um, and some collagen um, powder. But I do that um, knowing that, that that's not a good thing that I'm doing. Like I'm not under the false impression that, ooh, I'm having a collagen shake. This is great. No, 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 no. I, I'd rather have ground beef i'd rather have a steak instead right. um, i just do it sometimes to not be so hard on myself because sometimes i will do like super strict carnivore but i've noticed like when i put those things on my this amount of pressure on myself be super strict carnivore um and then if i like touch something like sweet and then i, I just fall overboard because in my mind i'm like being so rigid with it so now i've kind of like relax you know chill out if you're eating 90 percent carnivore you're doing good like it's fine if you have a bite of something you know one of these days it's not gonna kill yeah. you so yeah i'm always interested in in, in talking so i i don't do you know who dr lisa weidman is she's yes yeah okay. yeah she, she, she's an uh eye doctor yes and a carnivore yeah long time carnivore. Yeah. yes so she was one of the first carnivores that that we talked to and i'm always amazed at talking to a female who only eats meat because it's typically not thought of as being very feminine. Um, right, right, right. But I've started to see like more and more women eating this way and they look fantastic. I mean, the skin's glowing, they're healthy. Is that kind of what you saw? Like how was your transition from, I guess, a, a healthy diet to the carnivore and what kind of changes mm -hmm. did you start seeing? So unfortunately, because I decided to go through academia and unfortunately, because I decided to become a dietitian, it was a much harder road for me, ironically, um, because I spent years being brainwashed and being shown the studies that they want to show you only, right? The high fiber diets, whole grains, you know, all that, all that kind of crap. <laughs> and I believed it, obviously, and I tried to apply it. And then you just think, oh, it's just me. I need more willpower. You know, you just blame yourself, um, not realizing that they are not giving you all the whole picture, right? They're just giving you probably what they were taught. It's not like, you know, my instructors had an agenda, but, you know, it's, they, they follow what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics um, puts out. And then it's the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the, the ones at the top that know what's going on, you know? And I don't know if the ones at the top are doing it just out of ignorance because for them, like they've never struggled with weight. And so they're like, I'm going to become a dietitian. I've always been in shape. I'm still in shape. I'm just eating more whole grains. So it's like they never have to think about it much. And so they just like look at it as, you know, like reading from a book and repeating this stuff. And then it's like, yeah, why not partner with those food companies? They're giving us tons of money, you know, and clearly I'm not dying from eating those foods. So it's good for the whole world. Um, so it's that probably is how it happened. I'm not sure. So this is how those academic programs get built, right? And uh, all over the world, especially like in, in Lebanon, which is a developing country where we don't have our own, you know, association, we just take from what the, the, the United States is putting out and we follow that so that we are credentialed and so that, you know, we can, uh, yeah, I guess that's the word credentialed, right? Or um, accredited, okay. sorry, accredited is the word, yeah. 
So <laughs> it was very difficult for me, um, even though for years it never really gave me food freedom. I was always addicted to the carbs and the sugars and it was always very difficult. So it, it just made it a lot harder for me to eventually realize that it's all been wrong. And the only, the only reason I eventually came to understand that carnivore is the optimal human diet. It is our species specific diet, just like how lions eat meat, cats eat meat, dogs eat meat. Doesn't mean they can't eat grass or other things, but they're not gonna thrive, right? Unless you give them their species specific diet. Also humans eat meat, <laughs> like that's our diet, you know? So, um, the only reason I was able to eventually get to carnivore is because I persisted and I just refused to settle, you know, and be like, that's just how I am. You know, I'm always going to have some extra pounds. I'm always going to struggle with excess body fat and all that kind of stuff. And also I had acne. Also, I had anxiety. I mean, so many things. Mm. So because I was persistent trying to figure it out, and also because I'm a huge nerd, like I could read for hours, I, I will read everything about everything and anybody, like, I'll know everything, you know, <laughs> I, I'm just a very deeply curious person. <laughs> because of that, and um, the internet, uh, first, I discovered the paleo diet, because uh, around 18, 19, I was having also on top of the weight is the acne, um, not terrible cystic acne, but like, you know, under the skin, all of it, you could see bumps that are skin colored. And uh, on certain angles, you can tell like, it's not smooth, you know, right. And I was like, uh, really traumatized by it. And I saw all the dermatologists, they put me on every single drug you can imagine Accutane twice, mm. nothing works. Yeah, birth control pills, um, antibiotics, how stupid. I did antibiotics for three months. Obviously nothing worked. Yeah. Uh, so I was at my wit's ends and uh, after the Accutane, it started giving me cystic acne, which is something I never had before. <laughs> so it actually got worse. <laughs> so um, I started Googling and Googling even more. And I came across the book called The Acne Cure by Dr. Lauren Cordain. And um, that was before Amazon and Kindle. So I had to buy it and they sent it to me as a PDF file like via email. And I took it to my library and I printed out the book. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the first time I understood that hunter-gatherer societies have zero acne. Even their teenagers who are supposed to be in that insulin resistant stage where you're supposed to have acne and it's normal, they didn't have it. Um, and throughout history, we never had acne. And so, and the whole thing was about eating a paleo diet and, and it worked. I tried it for like the first 30 days. He says, after 30 days, you should see clear effect and it worked. And then I did it another 30 days and then it worked. But that second time when I was finishing, it was about the time that I was coming to Miami, starting my PhD, you know, it was like a lot of um, instability, you know. And so I remember when I first got to Miami, I stayed, uh, stayed paleo for a while, but I still remember like would order, you know, pizzas and stuff. So I wasn't doing it perfectly, which is why um, I, I saw a dermatologist in Miami as well, because mm -hmm. like I can't deal with so many things uh, at once. So while I get settled in a new country by myself, I knew nobody here. Like, it's not like I had an aunt or like nobody by myself. I didn't even have a car. So, <laughs> so I couldn't like deal with all those things. So I, I tried to do more paleo, but at the same time, definitely wasn't eating great. So I saw more dermatologists and it was like, even worse here. I remember the first dermatologist I saw in Miami and I asked him, do you know what the paleo diet is? And he was like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and then he prescribed me some drug and some topicals, you know? That's insane. So yeah, that's how it all started. That's like just putting that seed, that paleo diets and ancestral diets, all those things that I, I would was taught were fads because when I was getting my bachelor's in nutrition, our instructors were like, okay, your homework, like for a whole semester, every week in our homework was to critique a diet, why it's a fad. So every diet that does not adhere to what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics deems is a healthy diet is considered a fad diet. Even the diet that humans were born to eat and ate for 99.99% of their existence is somehow a fad diet by the Academy of Nutrition Ted Dietetics thinks, uh, yeah, anyway, it's, yeah. So 
<laughs> after I got into paleo diets, um, it worked. But at the same time, I was still doing carbs because like doing fruits with every meal and right. sweet potatoes and stuff like that. So between the acne and between an inability to draw body fat to where I wanted, I kept reading. And every time I would like binge on foods and eat crap and feel really bad, I'd go out being the nerd that I am and just buy all the books and read all the books. <laughs> and from there, I read um, the art and science of low carbohydrate living and then the art and science of low carbohydrate performance Two two um, books about keto written by the pioneers of um, ketogenic diet research doctors, um, Jeff Volick and Stephen Finney, where they talk about all the research that they're doing and they've done on keto and how this is the natural human state. Babies are born in a state of ketosis. Babies or breast milk is actually a ketogenic diet food designed to keep the baby in that ketosis state. It's as if babies are supposed to be on a ketogenic diet mm. until they're weaned off. What do we do instead? We wean them off and we give them breast milk where the first ingredient is high fructose, high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, I yeah, know, it's crazy. <laughs> so um, from there, I did keto, which really, the first time I did keto, by day seven, I felt like the lights came back on. I had no idea I had brain fog until I entered the state of ketosis and became keto adapted. Um, and the, and I had that mental clarity. I was like, wow, this is how other people <laughs> feel. This is amazing. Um, and eventually, again, more research. I read um, The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gunji, where he talks about plants want to kill you because they don't want to be eaten. We think like we think that plants have no self-defense mechanism because they can't fight you directly if you're trying to eat it, unlike an animal. But they do. And instead of moving, because they can't, they have become master chemists where they create a bunch of chemicals that are tar like targeted missiles um, in your body designed to weaken you because you are the predator. And the weaker you are and the less fertile you are, the better for the plant. Because if you can't reproduce, that's great for them. And if you die, that's even better. Yes. So <laughs> I like, I like listening to, uh, Dr. Paul Saladino, where he talks about how, um, you know, chemicals have defense or plants have defense chemicals in them. And in fact, uh, we use some of those chemicals to, to fight off insects on crops and stuff like that, like, or where they're in cleaning products and stuff like that. So it's pretty insane that these are natural formed chemicals inside plants. So that was a yeah. shocker to me. 99.99% .99 of pesticides in the American diet isn't coming from the pesticides that we apply. It's coming from the actual plants, natural pesticide. Mm. I'm going to say that again. 99.99% .99 of the pesticides in the American diet comes from the actual plants you eat, not the pesticides that we produce and we put on the plants. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Caffeine is a natural insecticide, right? I, I love caffeine, caffeine though. I love caffeine. Do you, um, do you drink caffeine? Or no, coffee? I haven't had. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to cut it out the first time I did 30 days and then went back and then I did another 30 days and went back. And finally, November 13th, 2021, I cut it out. And so it's got about to be seven months now. And I don't even think about it. like, I know I'll never go, go back to it ever again in mm. my life. That's like my yeah. one like I, thing that I can't let go. I can let go of sugar, you know, pizza and all that stuff. But caffeine, I, I haven't tried letting it go yet. Like I haven't attempted it. But I don't well, want you need to. a reason. Yeah. yeah. If you don't want to. Yeah. I mean, you got to have a reason. I have headaches that, you know, may that are like very recurrent. And so for me, I knew that caffeine was a big trigger. That's why I had to get it out. It's mm. horrible to have headaches and be able to be, you know, functioning and do all the things that I do. So that's that was a strong reason. You got to have a strong reason. Yeah. Do, you know, I'm curious to to learn about your family a little bit because mm -hmm. ever since I've kind of dived off into the animal based diet, I would say I, you know, I I stick to you know grass fed, grass uh, finished beef. My family owns uh, a ranch and we raise our own cattle, so um, I'm able to get you know locally sourced meat myself, which is a blessing in itself. Um, and then you know I eat fruit and and honey and stuff like that. 
but I, um, my family hates and even my wife, my kids, they hate when I like start talking about if they have something like acne or something, or they're, they got like a sore muscles. I always am starting to attribute that to food. Um, and my family doesn't like talking to me. I'm curious. Does your family kind of feel the same? Well, I don't talk to most of my family, so (laughs) (laughs) that's that. Um, But uh, I do talk to my aunt and, uh, you know, we talk about those things. But, you know, Lebanon is going through like a really hard time right now. Actually, in the past two, three years, it's gotten even worse. The currency, the Lebanese lira, the currency deteriorated by 90% in like less than a year. I think I think that happened in 2020 or 2021. I can't remember. Yeah. So they're they're just in survival mode. They're not thinking about <laughs> yeah. I have acne. That's not right, right now where they're at. But before that, we used to have those discussions and they know, they understand, but um it's addictive. It's highly addictive. And they also have very strong beliefs that, oh, you know, oh, meat is so heavy. I can't live without pasta. Like just, you yeah. know, what I think people have to be wanting uh, uh, to, to get better in a certain area, you know, very, very strongly, because it's going to be a hard transition. It's not going to be easy um, to all of a sudden start eating a carnivore diet, although it's not really that hard, I think. But, you know, that for, for somebody who hasn't been in health and fitness or fitness minded that way, it might be hard, much harder for them. You know, it's like, you know what? Leave me alone. Right. I'm happy. <laughs> no, absolutely. You know, but, you know, growing up in uh, the Hispanic culture, you know, we like tortillas and beans and, and rice all those heavy carb foods. So when I visit my family, it's a point of contention. Like, why are you eating that way? Why are you eating, uh, you know, burgers with just eggs and cheese or why do you eat that? Oh, they're telling you. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they think of me as weird or because I don't feed my kids, um, sugar in the mornings. I give them, you know, fruit or, or eggs, something of substance, um, Mm. instead of pancakes. So I'm kind of like the, I'm, I'm kind of the, the oddball out in the family because of that, but because you, you you doing the right thing highlights the fact that they're not doing what they're supposed Mm. to do. And it puts it in, in like you, you put them on the spot, just your existence (laughs) around them. (laughs) They're like, why do you want to remind me that I'm eating crap? It's not like they don't know they're eating crap. You know, they just pretend to be in denial. That's, that's just normal human nature. (laughs) So you mentioned that you still teach. Do you also do any type of uh, nutritional coaching outside of the education world yeah so i do but i don't like advertise for it Mm. because for me um to have a greater impact and a lot more yeah impact i guess is the word um doing what i'm doing with youtube um i can reach thousands of people as opposed to you know being one-on-one with one person but like when people you know shoot me an email if I, I generally do take them on um unless I'm having like an exceptionally crazy month but yeah like I if you notice like I never even advertise for it yeah, yeah that's why I was curious but I would imagine people yeah. reaching out to you especially women is, is that who yeah. Uh, predominantly reaches out to you is, is no women, is I'm actually women? probably more men than women or an equal equal with a s- slight more men than women but I wouldn't say more men more women than men you know what now that I think about it I'd say more like a 50 50 okay I would say more yeah yeah what? there is definitely no I'm not like skewed one way or, or another because I feel like women a lot of them um understand like they delve a lot into the nutrition stuff like they follow that stuff very closely um and uh so i get a lot of that for weight loss bloating things like that or thyroid issues but then with men um it's because we have a lot of men doing carnivore i do think there is a little bit more men than women doing carnivore and given that i'm in the carnivore world I tend to get a lot more of that as well. Do you think (laughs) think the sensational, uh, you know, the sensation of, of, of carnivore and how it's kind of picked up steam on social media, like liver King, um, you know, Paul Saladino. Do you think that at some point it's going to get hijacked and be something like the plant-based world where, 
there's made up food because you know the plant based community not all of it's bad they they want to do good right but now it's like yeah. they got like fake meat and fake yeah. food do you think the carnivore world is going that way because of like the social media presence on Instagram? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of interest of how can we monetize that? The problem is that how can we, like in reality, do anything that's processed with just red meat? <laughs> it's like, I'm sure they've thought about it, but it's like, what are you, what are you going to do with yep. red meat? You yeah. know, other than bars, you know, it's like beef, salt and fat. It's difficult to do that. But with a vegetarian diet or a plant-based diet, I mean, the opportunities are endless. And so there's a lot more money there to be made. Hence why you hear so much about it and why you have all these ads and all of these sponsored blogs and posts um, to push this message that plants are good for you. Let's put a health claim on that. It's just because there's a lot of money to be made. And so there's more incentive to, um, enlists somewhat naive influencers who might think that a plant-based diet is healthy just because they haven't really had any issues they just want to be healthier and everybody says a plant-based diet it's healthier so you know it's like yeah sure great i will work with you but um uh, but it's uh but yeah it's not like the influencers are ill-meaning or any or you know they have any ill intentions they just uh useful tools really um to to make a ton of money yeah, no, absolutely. So I've had this argument with some um, some vegan folks about how the carnivore world will eventually get to the place of 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 I guess fake food like vegans are. But that exact yeah. reason, what you said, it's it's so yeah. hard. You can't. It's meat, like yeah. like true carnivore or animal based you diet. You can't fake you that. Can't, you know, you can't become a carnivore um, by having very limited nutritional um, liter uh, uh, literacy, but it's very easy to become a vegan when you have very low nutritional literacy. So right. that's a major, <laughs> I know they like to feel like, Oh, you're just like us. Like, no, 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 no. We've been there. <laughs> As well yeah. as every carnivore has been plant-based before or vegan, everybody, including yep. myself. No, yeah, absolutely. So What's completely the what what's a day in the life look like for you um as far as your diet uh, how many times a day do you eat what are you consuming that kind of thing mm. um so i don't force intermittent fasting but usually i it happens naturally um because i like to do my cardio first before i have my first meal so i'll wake up i did my ideal time to wake up will be 4 4 30 but it doesn't always uh, work that way because I have a very hard time forcing myself to sleep at night like early on um, so most of the time I'm up by 5 or 5 30 and then um, like in a couple of hours I have a treadmill it's actually right here next to me in my office so I will run six miles like super fast I'm always pushing myself to get faster and faster on that so there's always a, a, a level of progression there right and then I will, uh, at that point, after I'm done, I will have breakfast. That's when I'm breaking my fast. So I would have, I, I um, grease the pan with some leftover bacon grease so that I don't use, you know, Pam or any of those uh, seed oils, you know, industrial seed oils. Right. And I'll, I'll do eggs. Normally it's like three eggs and I'll do bacon. And I was able to find bacon without any sugar. So I'll do bacon without any added sugar in the ingredient list. I'll do those and then around like three, four, four hours later, um, I will have, let's say a piece of salmon. Um, and then sometimes, sometimes it depends how late I had my breakfast. Sometimes it's like two meals a day. Um, and sometimes it's three meals a day. So it depends how early I have my first meal. If I have my first meal very early on, I tend to have three meals a day. If I have my first meal very late, then I'll have two meals a day. And so I, I kind of know how to like, tweak things so that if I'm if I know I'm going to be having only two meals this day, then I'll increase the portions. Um, but yeah, generally, you know, lunch and or dinner are very similar. It's either salmon or ground beef. <laughs> what? and a bacon sometimes i'll add just bacon to that um but yeah it can it can be a rotisserie chicken you, i could do that i just it, i don't always go and buy myself a rotisserie chicken so it's just easier to do ground beef um okay. that's pretty much just chicken wings chicken thighs chicken drumsticks those are all things that i can rotate but uh, like recently i haven't been doing that um yeah 
Okay. So what? So where do you get your beef from? Is that a big thing for you? Do you try to get grass fed or is it no, just normal meat? No, no, no. I don't. Yeah, I don't worry too much about that. I mean, it would be great to get high quality grass fed beef. But um, if people are listening to this and they are intimidated and feel like, oh, I can only have organic grass fed beef in order to get the benefits, like, no, don't worry about it. Any kind of beef that you can get your hands on is going to improve your health by 95%, if not 99% compared to whatever you're doing now. Just eat any meat you can get your hands on. That's that's all. And that's how I do it. Yeah. No, that that's that's great advice. What's kind of the biggest um like when you're when you're helping people, what's the number one thing that you do um to kind of get people transition out of the the standard American diet into animal based mm. or carnivore? What's the number one thing that you seem to have noticed has helped more? Yeah. It depends on how the client is. So sometimes I'll, I'll be trying to take them, like take it easy, giving them a dirty keto phase first so that they can adapt to doing a low carb and enter that fat burning phase first and then transition them to carnivore. So I'm, sometimes I'm trying to do that to make sure they hit those goals. And they're like, no, 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 I'm excited. I'm inspired. I want to do full carnivore. I'm like, well, great. Then, you know, I'll give them a full blown carnivore diet. Um, and then other people, they're like, you know, but I love that salad, just just some tomatoes and, you know, cucumbers. That's all I have. And it, I like I really want to keep it at least in the first few weeks. I'm like, fine, we can keep that. But those other things, like you eat those and you bloat right after, like I got to cut, cut those out. Um, so it's very individual. It's a very personalized approach. It really depends. And people generally know themselves. They know their psychology. Are they an, like an all or nothing kind of? person or are they people who are like i just i just need to do this as pain free as possible right. <laughs> so yeah there are different ways to go about it i think for the vast majority if not maybe like 50 percent of the people they prefer to do it a little bit slow especially if they're heavily addicted to foods and so for those people i do have a youtube video on my channel dr sarah zaldivar is the channel and uh, so just put my name and then put how to pull yourself out of sugar and carbohydrate addiction mm -hmm. and i give you all the different foods you can have during that dirty keto phase where there's almost no pain, like you don't feel the pain because you're still eating keto pizza, you're still eating keto ice cream, you know, but at least it's giving your body a chance to recover the inflammation from all the carbs you've been eating. And after you do that for a couple of weeks, you will naturally want to cut that crap out. And then we remove those processed foods. And now we transition to, well, still doing low carb or keto, but now it's real whole foods like meats. No, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to get your, your thought on something. Cause there's, um, I forget who it is, but she talks a lot about, um, like, like birth control for women and how it's, it's so bad for you yeah. and, and how it messes up your, your, your hormone, your hormone system over long periods of time. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and you know, are, are you seeing a shift amongst women staying away from birth control versus, yeah. Back in the 90s, I feel like everyone was taking it. Now it's almost like taboo to take it. Yeah, and that's good. Um, I remember when I was put on birth control, I, well, it was mainly for my acne. Um, I was never informed of the negative effects. You know, I, I'm just a busy student, barely keeping my head above water, trying to do a PhD all by myself in a brand new country in a field that I never knew about because I was doing nutrition and now I'm doing exercise physiology. So um, I just wanted a quick patch of Band-Aid too, so that I'm not being so traumatized by my skin so I can, you know, function <laughs> and not be so depressed about it. Um, and that's how it, I think it, this happens to a lot of students and a lot of younger women. But I feel, I, I don't know if it's on a case by case basis, depending if you're lucky, if you are informed of all of the side effects or not. My experience with that has been it never worked for me. My best friend who's a nutrition professor gave her acne and she was using it for contraception It actually made her skin gave, gave her acne for the first time in her life so she quit that um i have clients who i've worked with who um were taking the contraceptives and i made sure that i got them off of it and i gave them alternatives and so um that's been my experience i don't know if like what's the overall, I, 
I don't know if everybody feels like it's taboo about birth control. I really, I'm not familiar or I, I don't know. Um, what I would say is that the problem with conventional medicine is that it does not address the root cause of the problem, right? It doesn't look into wh what is causing this disease. Let me, let me add one more thing. When I was working at the University of Miami, I worked there on a project where we worked to rehabilitate stroke, stroke victims. Every single stroke victim in our study was middle-aged with clear comorbidities. So they had uh, overweight or obesity or high blood pressure, et cetera except two young, very healthy, seemingly healthy women, the only thing that they had in common, they were like in their 20s, less than, none of them had even hit 30. Um, the only thing that they had in common is that they were on birth control. That's the only common denominator. Um, it's like, how, how can a 20 year old, 25 year old have a stroke that requires rehabilitation? We were teaching them how to walk again, you know? Um, so that's that's another experience I guess I could add with regards to, you know, what birth control pills could potentially do. Um, and it's not like I have zero tolerance to side effects, you know? Sometimes if I have a really bad headache, I'll take a Midol. Mm. It's not like it's terrible. Um, it's just that whenever we have an alternative, why should we take a drug, you know, why should we inject those things into our bodies and um, clearly mess our hormones that one of the single most important determinants of how healthy you're going to be and how well you're going to age. Why would we ever want to mess with that? A lot of women, when they're taking birth control for a long period of time, they don't get a period. I mean, anything that you put in your body to stop a normal physiological function like menstruation, like just logically, like what, what exactly do you think is going to happen to your body? Right. <laughs> do you really think this is harmless? Um, so a lot of women, eventually, they, they're off the pill because they want to get pregnant. And guess what? We can't get pregnant. Well, yeah. like, surprise, surprise. Yeah. You've been sending a message to your body for decades telling it, I don't want to have a baby. And now all of a sudden you think that you can. I, I feel like today, like these days, everyone's waking up, not just to nutrition, but everything, what we're putting in our body, we're starting to like wake up to, hey, if it's not coming from the ground or an animal in some form or fashion, natural way, it's probably not good for you. So birth control is one of those. And I was interested to see what, what you know, what you thought about it. Yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's definitely a lot more awareness about living a clean life, you know, just overall. Um, and, and that's great and fantastic. And we want more of that. Um, but yeah, like, with the with the with the birth control, it's, uh, it's, it's a real problem when we mess our hormones and suppress them artificially, they have all kinds of side effects, like people need to read that really, and um, determine whether they are willing to take those risks for especially like for, for acne there's no reason to because we know like diet is the number one thing you need to do right so it makes no sense there there is there is something you can do that's actually going to treat the root cause not only is it going to treat the root cause of your acne it's going to treat the root cause of your ill health because acne is just a reflection of poorer health uh, now with regards to contraception there are also so many other non-toxic methods that you can use and i think it's also something that we need to think of as women, why is it that we need to poison our bodies with synthetic drugs, whereas men don't have to put anything in their bodies, you know, just so that we don't have a baby. So th there has to be like a conversation between a couple so that they understand when is the fertile period, when is the ovulatory period, and uh, what are the things that we can do, even though it might be a little inconvenient, but at least, you know, her body's not going to be um, damaged by that so that if in the future, Sure, she decides to have a baby she doesn't struggle uh, like so many women are struggling these days or like she completely loses her period some some women don't even get their period for like a year afterwards if they do you know if they ever do get that yeah it's a scary it's a scary thing you know because i have daughters and the more i see on um you know the the impacts on birth control and what they have and what it does to women's bodies that i'm scared you know, yeah. there's, there's two coins. You know, there's, there's two sides of the coin. I don't want my daughters to get pregnant. And I know that you know, I need to have the conversations with them and they need to be aware of what sex can do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, kids are kids, you know, <laughs> they're going to make mistakes. Just hopefully it's, true, you true. know, they're practicing yeah. safe sex, you know. 
It's true. Yeah, and practice safe sex. Know when is the ovulatory period. Um, there are other things, although I'm not so sure how safe they are, like uh, copper IUDs. But again, copper is a heavy metal. Some people struggle with too much copper, copper buildup. Um, so I think, honestly, I think the best thing is to use a condom and um, just pay attention during some like there are like four or five days where you're like very high risk to get pregnant. Just chill out. Right. <laughs> Those four to five days, you yeah. know. Um, and yeah, education and awareness for men and women, because a lot of the times, especially like a, a, as a teenager or a young adult, um, girls um, might be influenced, it depends, or even boys might be influenced, it depends on the level of self-esteem really of, of the child uh, by the other person, you know, Um I know like personally in my experiences, it's like, I'm always the one who suggests, no, let's use a condom, you know? And a lot of the times there is a little bit of resistance on the other end. So women need to be taught how to be assertive. You know, that's a, another thing that women struggle with um, that we, we always want to be people pleasers. A lot of times we're raised to be people pleasers, right? right. We want to smooth out any kind of uh, resistance around us. And that, that also goes into those kinds of situations where you get pressured um, because you like the boy or you, you like the man and you don't, you know, you, you don't want them to leave you because you, you can, you, you only want them to wear a condom. Otherwise you're not going to do it then. So I understand those situations. Um, so yeah, education, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-assertiveness, uh, all those things are really, really important. You said something that, that was pretty, if, if a guy gets mad because the girl wants you to wear a condom, then yeah. you need to stay away from that guy anyway. That guy's a piece that's, of shit. You know what I mean? That's but, a toxic relationship. 100%. Yeah. yeah. There's no yeah. boundaries. There's the guy's not respecting what the woman wants. So if exactly. the girl needs to run far away. As fast exactly. as possible. But it's, it's, I understand it's easier said than done because like I grew up without a, a strong male figure. Like my father was like an absent figure in my life. So it was very easy for me to get into toxic relationships. You know, it was very easy for me to be manipulated. So I do understand how much harder it can be. Um, but, you know, if you have a father like you are the, to your daughter, it's like they're so lucky to have a person who understands these concepts and you show them what a man is supposed to be and how you're supposed to treat the other person and uh, the woman in your life. And so they grew up knowing that that's the norm and anything less than that, they won't take it. But if you don't have that, then, you know, that, then, then you really need to, you know, work on yourself. But yeah. Do you, I'm curious whenever you're teaching, um, do you get to teach how you want to teach and what you want to teach as far as nutrition or, you know, maybe if it, yeah. it dies off into other things, or do you have to abide by abide yeah. by like a certain framework? Yeah, there is a basic um, like textbook that we have to use. And I use the textbook that the uh, university, the college uh, assigns, because remember, we're from Miami Dade College is a public college. So we receive funding from the government and for the government to give you funding, you want to make sure everything is standardized. So there are basics. They choose the textbook. So they, we use that as like a reference book, but really um, the basics don't change much. So they go over the lectures and they, they understand the basics, but then when we're meeting, it's a Q&A and it's a discussion. So we're talking for hours, you yeah. know, and they're asking me, and it's all about them asking me questions and us discussing. And so as a professor, you have a right to share your opinion about topics when you're asked, you're protected under the law. At least I know that's how it is in New Zealand. I remember Professor Bart K, who is well known also in the carnivore world. He told me that I haven't looked into it um, in the United States, mainly because I don't really care whether I stay or not. <laughs> I'm you know, more focused on my uh, business. Um, so but I'm, I'm assuming it's like the same thing in the United States. No. Yeah. So do you, um, I imagine some of your students follow you on social media. So did, do they, um, question like your lifestyle and how it, uh, maybe contradicts some of the stuff that's being taught in the book? Do they bring up well, questions like that? 
yeah, sometimes they're confused, you know, they're like, but wait, it says glucose is the main energy source. And but you're telling us fats and ketones are actually a better fuel source. So then I explained them, yes, like I'm, I have to give you the basics, you, you must know this stuff, because you're gonna go most of my students end up be, becoming nurses, not all of them, but the bulk, and then they get end up working in hospitals. So I don't want them to have like a shock on the <laughs> first day in the, in the hospital. Like, why are you giving rice to a diabetic patient? You know, it's like, what? the hell and so I tell them like you know I'm supposed to give you the basics but at the same time it's bs and you need to know that there's a whole body of literature um that completely opposes these cherry picked information that are driven a lot by um really by profit and and uh, lobbying efforts do you think at some point and and in the future the textbooks are going to change to what's really correct or do you think there's just too much no, money involved? No, I think involved? just people are going to realize that going through academic programs is a waste of time. <laughs> just like right now, I guess you can, I don't know if you're aware, but like most universities and colleges, like it's going down, you know, the amounts of people that are uh, registering because now you've got the internet, you've got YouTube, you've got influencers, people who have actually achieved and great things in their life and became successful. And they have now a platform to share their knowledge with the rest of us and so now the parents and the children have access to this information that tells them that is it really smart to gather all this debt so that you can learn outdated information? It takes an average of 17 to 20 years for the science that is coming out right now to actually translate into the academic textbooks and clinical practice. Mm. So everything we're teaching is that old, is like 20 years old, mm. right? And so I think kids are becoming brighter and smarter in a younger age because it's like we are living in the age of information and parents, same thing, you know, parents want to do the best for their kids. And so I think, um, I don't, I don't see how universities and colleges can really sustain this um, business model. This is the only business model that does not give you a guarantee or a full refund. If you can't get a job afterwards, yeah. <laughs> any other business is like, you know, you, you have some form of guarantee, but they can't do that in academia because they're, they're giving out degrees but they know that most of those students aren't going to find a good job in this um you know in this field yeah at, you know everyone's getting um you know it you know you know 20 years ago a bachelor's degree meant something in the world um in the united <laughs> states now everyone has a bachelor's degree in something you know what i mean um exactly. I, i'm going back to school right now for for an engineering degree i have a communications degree but i work in the manufacturing environment so i work in a, in a plant setting um, a communications degree doesn't really do a whole lot in that setting. So I went back for engineering, but I'm, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm noticing, or I, my, my thoughts are that I am actually getting dumber going back to school because, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I say that too, because, you know, up to this point in my career where I've gotten pretty far, I've gotten f far because I have a, you know, high work ethic and I'm, I, I teach myself things and I'm able to go and learn new things on my own. Now that yeah. I'm, I'm having to get taught this material, I, I don't have time to expand my knowledge beyond what my work, you know, what, what I can to achieve like innovation and digital stuff at work. I have to be taught mm -hmm. this stuff that everyone else is being taught. So I like mm -hmm. my theory is I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm learning what they know, but I'm not really getting any smarter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And in a way you're getting it from one perspective. I'm not sure with um, engineering, if you can, you know, like that might actually be probably one of the very, very few fields uh, like, like a law lawyer, becoming a lawyer or becoming an engineer where it might still be worth going through a traditional academic program. Uh, but it depends on your goal. Like, what is it that you want? You know, do you want to stay in that company and that degree is going to help you move forward? Or do you want to be a full blown entrepreneur, take more risks, but potentially make a lot more, have more impact and more money and all the stuff that comes with that. So, right. No, no, can. no. Yeah. I, I, I fully agree with what you're saying. I, I think there's some fields like, uh, you know, you said engineering, but I think like healthcare, um, there are some fields that you have to go to school for to learn these specific set of parameters to, to do stuff. But I think, yeah. I think as you were saying, you know, we live in the information age, you, you can teach yourself so much off of YouTube and Google now. And uh, faster too. And a yeah. lot faster. And I yeah. think, I think, you know, we're going to get to this point where 
you can almost take like for coding, uh, programming software, stuff like that. You can almost get accredited or get a degree or something like that off offline now. And, and businesses yeah. and companies are going to have to respect that at some point. Yeah. You know? Well, they, they're going to have to. I mean, there are already a lot of shortages in the market. So eventually it's like you're going to have to hire someone. Yeah. No. You yeah. Know? yeah. It's it's yeah. it's crazy times. Um, what's I guess what's your your future plans? Um, where do you see yourself kind of in five and 10 years? Where do you want to take your social media presence and, and how do you continue uh, to want to help people? Yeah, just uh, more of what I'm doing, growing my YouTube channel is my number one um, major effort, despite all of the censorship that is being inflicted on any health information that is not backed by the pharmaceutical companies. Because if you're recommending the vaccine, or if you're recommending, you know, the traditional mainstream view of medicine, oh, you're, you're golden, they'll push you up, you know, and everything. Um, but if you have anything that is not, that could potentially threaten some of those large companies, and make the people less um, dependent on um, regular treatments and drugs, then, you know, like we saw with what happened the last few years with the pandemic, I mean, we got censored heavily. I, I received a strike on my YouTube channel because mm -hmm. I put out a video teaching people how to strengthen their immune system with a diet as opposed to, um, you know, taking drugs. And th the only thing was like the title was called the coronavirus diet, which is the, it's not that sensational. I mean, all kinds of health books can have sensational um, titles, but that's exactly what was the purpose of the course, you know, a diet to improve your outcomes if you happen to catch a virus and better yet, like how to prevent that. Um, and literally the next day, and it was getting tons of traction, literally the next day it got pulled down mm. and I received a strike. Thankfully it wasn't like, uh, not a strike, sorry, a warning. Thankfully it wasn't a strike because if you get three strikes, then they cut like they will take out your YouTube channel and you won't even be able to create another YouTube channel yeah. in the future. That's yeah. so it's really bad. So, you know, censorship is real. I hope this is a real problem that seems to not go away. You remember, you know who Professor Bartz K is from what I hear. Yeah, he had yeah. 20,000. Um, so he quit his job as a professor at a university teaching exercise physiology and nutrition and cardiovascular health quit that job because he realized he's just teaching, you know, rubbish and they're not letting him talk about what he truly thinks is a healthier approach, which is ancestral diets and stuff. So he quit that and worked on his YouTube channel and it took him like four years to get to over 20,000 subscribers so that he can now has a, an income that matches what he used to make as a professor. Well, I just heard like two days ago, it's all over and you know, everybody's tweeting about it they eliminate they took down his channel Whoa. they literally wiped out his subscribers out of nowhere they removed his subscribers now if you go and you look at bart case it'll show there's one video there and there he has like a hundred subscribers that's freaking crazy right yeah. that should not be happening not in the united states of america i did not come from lebanon what? <laughs> to, the, to the united states what i mean what know? i mean he was just talking about you know like an animal based or an ancestral diet that's all it was yeah, like he just crazy. talks about but yeah i mean freedom of speech you know he's not inciting violence he's you know he's talking about health and going back to real health so i don't know um censorship is definitely a problem but Despite that, that is my uh, the thing that I'm working on the most, uh, growing my um, YouTube channel. And of course, you know, Instagram, those are the two areas where I'm most active um, and just creating, you know, a business within that health sphere. Right. That's, yeah, that's the full focus. No, that's, I, I absolutely love your content and I love the information that you're sharing because um, it it's it's truly helped me. Um, and I know, I know it's helped other people too. Um, and I overall, I feel like a better person when I, when I eat this way and when I, and when I'm out in the sun and when I'm exercising and I, I feel better feeding my kids this way too. And i can see things in them. So I, I, I love talking to people like yourself and I love the messaging that you put out and it's, it's, it's overall all fantastic. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, I appreciate your time. I know you're very busy, so I'll let you get back to your, your daily life. I had a great time with you and I'll let you know when this comes out.
All Thank right. you so much, Jonathan. This has been wonderful. I, and I love talking with people who understand the importance of health and food and uh, have, you know, can see through the BS that it propagates the vast majority of content out there, unfortunately, not because people want to do that, just because, you know, it's just Ill, Ill infor- being ill-informed, you know, and not having gone through a personal experience with uh, with applying that information. Because once you have to go through that personal experience and try to apply what everybody tells you is good for you, and you realize that that doesn't work, that's really when um, you, you dive deeper into the research and you take matters in your own hands. So I'm glad to, to, to know that it's working for you and your family. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you for your time. I'll talk to you later. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.